I'm Christy and I'm Mark I want to let you know we're doing incredibly well we hope you are doing incredibly well and we miss you incredibly we have moved in the last month and we are loving it incredibly and we've just been homeschooling and enjoying our incredible time together remember we serve an incredible God love you bye Happy Sunday to you, Quest. It's that time again. Yep, you guessed it. Here's the skinny. Got prayer requests? We want to pray for you. You can submit prayer requests online and indicate if you want it to remain private or to make it public. If you want your prayer request to be public, it'll go on the prayer request page so all of our questers can know who or what to be praying for. We aren't totally sure what this summer will bring, but we want to be prepared for whatever may come. Quest Kids is going forward with plans for their summer program and their quest to find truth. Karen Robertson is in need of a few more people to help lead the kids on this important quest. Whether in person or virtually, depending on how this quarantine business goes, would you consider helping? You can email Karen at karen.robertson at questchurchstl.org to get all the information. We've started hosting weekly Touch Base Tuesday meetings and prayer on Tuesday nights at 7.30 p.m. If you're interested in joining the group, you can get the upcoming week's Zoom meeting code on the event page on our website. There's no need to sign up for any of these things at the ministry table. Just go to the website for all the information you may be looking for. What's the website, you ask? Well, it is questchurchstl.org. Of course! Good morning, you guys. Uh, it's good to see you. Good to be with you. Uh, and just so we're all on the same page, we're here. This is Sunday, April 19th, 2020. This is the 357th day of March, or at least it feels like that. Sometimes we kind of lose track of what day of the week it is, what day of the month it is, what month we're in, uh, in this whole new kind of strange experience that we're all going through. But there are a variety of things, it seems to me, that we're learning through this, what I call the corona chaos. Um, you're probably learning all sorts of things, too. But three things that come to my mind that we're learning uh, in the midst of this. The first, or maybe kind of a, as a base statement, crises create all sorts of things. And, and I think in this situation, in this crisis, crisis creates courage is the first one. And we've seen all sorts of people. A lot of those frontliners, and really far beyond that, but have created incredible courage to face this crisis, to take risks, to sacrifice, and they've had a lot of courage. And so this is a beautiful thing that we've learned through this. Another thing, maybe not quite so beautiful, is that crisis creates conflict. And I think we're in the midst of some of that conflict as we try to work through this. People are getting a little tired. Uh, then now we're beginning to have increasing levels of disagreement on things. And so I want us to really be aware of the crisis that creates this conflict and that we would stay away from conflict, work away from the conflict. Um, but the, sad, the third thing, something that I think was going to touch for today, is that crisis creates questions. Eventually, in any crisis, we begin to ask questions about life, about ourselves, about other people. We ask questions about God we ask questions in the midst of all of this. And I think we're coming to that. And in fact, maybe those questions will linger over time. And so we've decided to do a series called What and Why? Answers Grounded in Faith and Hope. Because this requires that those questions be addressed and try to give answers that make sense. 
make sense both to our head and to our heart. And I've chosen as kind of a baseline here a passage out of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. That we could maybe uh, build a foundation and a thought process for us to start from as we begin to address all these different questions. So it seems to me, uh, in the midst of all this, there could be those who would ask us, why do you have hope? Maybe they've observed as Christians that we seem to have a hope that they're having a hard time relating to. And so when they ask that question, why do you have hope? We want to answer it with, I have hope because. I have hope because of all sorts of things. And that hope is really the Greek word, elpis. And it means an expectation, a trust, a confidence that is grounded in what is sure and certain. We have hope. Hope is not a blind hope. It is not a stupid hope. It's not just a hopeful hope. We don't have hope in hope itself. We have hope that's an expectation, a trust, and a confidence that is grounded in something that is sure and certain. That's what we'll be looking into. Now, let's turn to, to 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, and, and verses 13 to 17, and, uh, and let's ask these questions. This passage will force us to ask ourselves these questions. First of all, it, is it important to be energetic for that which is good? For that which is in, intrinsically, inherently good? Something that fills up the human soul. It is important to be energetic about those things. Second question, what does it mean to honor Christ as holy in my heart? What does that mean? Because this passage is going to relate to that, and we want to ask, do we know what it means? Third, how can we be prepared to give a defense to anybody who asks me for the reason why I have hope and why I believe and why I believe it? Fourth question, have I lived out hope in a way that is unique and attractive? Have I lived that out? It's a tough question. It's a hard one to face. It might be really uncomfortable for each one of us to ask that of ourselves. Next question. Do I grasp the importance of interacting with people in, with gentleness and respect? Do I understand why that's so important? Next question. Do I have a good and clear conscience? as I represent the Christian message or the gospel? Can I do it with a clear conscience? Well, let's jump into 1 Peter. In fact, I want to just back up a couple of verses so that we can kind of put it in context. Uh, and here in 1 Peter chap chapter 3, verse 8, Peter writes this. He says, finally, all of you. Now, right before this, this section, in the early part of chapter 3, he's talking about husbands and wives. He's talking about their relationship to each other and how to handle that. It's interesting that we just finished a series on marriage. And we're just talking about that in marriage and family. And we're talking about that important relationships in a family and in a marriage. And so Peter's talking about that too to these people who have been displaced from Israel. And they find themselves in, North, in Asia Minor, kind of northern Turkey. And they are struggling through the persecution. And he talks to them, okay, husbands and wives, there's going to be tension. Here's how I want you to deal with it. And then he says, finally, to all of you, because there's going to be tension for all of you. He says this. These are incredible thoughts. Have unity of mind. Be united in the way you think. Have sympathy for each other. Have brotherly love for each other. Have a tender heart and a humble mind. These are really great qualities from the midst of chaos, in the midst of crises, that we would be unity of mind, have sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and a humble mind. And then he goes on in verse 9, he says, Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, instead of getting in this conflict of poking each other with a stick, that we'd say, on the contrary, bless. For to this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. Let's bless each other. And then he's going to quote here Psalms. Look at this. He writes, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. 
Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and, the ear, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. In fact, look at this. It comes right out of Psalm 34. Let me just read what he says there. The psalmist writes, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he should see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. See, we're committed to doing good. To doing that which is intrinsically healthy for the human soul and for the human body to do good not only for ourselves, but for others, right? Now, that gets into verse 13, where we want to camp today. It says in verse 13, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Who's going to harm you when you seek the good of others? The question here really begs the answer is, is nobody, or at least not very many people. Because in verse 14 he says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake. So he's equating righteousness with doing what's good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Do what is right. Do what is good. Do what is, in, what is healthy for the human, for you and for your neighbor. And don't be afraid of what goes on. And then in verse 15, I want you to circle it. But, and it's not in contrast, but in addition to, he says, but in your hearts, honor Christ as holy. Now, I want to go back and look at this word heart. It's a really powerful word because in our culture, sometimes the heart, we simply kind of think it's kind of that emotional center. Uh, it's kind of the ooey gooey, nice uh, pixie dust kind of thing. But in, in Greek, in the first century, the heart was far different than that. Uh, this word in Greek means cardia. It means the heart, the mind, the inner self, the will, the intention, the center of a person. You see, the heart almost never in the scriptures represents simply the physical thing, or the physical beating heart inside of us. It means the center of a person, the core of who we are. In other words, it means the affective center of our being and our capacity for moral preference. It is the core of who we are as people. Look at this. It's the center and the seat of spiritual life. One person put it this way, the soul or mind. It is the fountain and seat of the thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, and endeavors. The human heart is that non-material part of the God-breathed image-bearing portion of mankind. You see, the human heart is the core of who we are and where we live and what we do and why we do it. It is the place where we make incredible decisions. So in your hearts, he says, honor Christ the Lord as holy. In your hearts, set him apart as something far more beautiful than anything else. Set it apart. We're sanctified. Sanctify our hearts in, in that then we say Christ is really the Lord and he is holy. And because I have given my life to him, something's different, pro profoundly different. So in our hearts, we honor Christ as holy. Always common. He says, always being prepared to make a defense. Let's look at this word defense for just for a second. It's a Greek word, apologia. It's a verbal defense in a court of law. It's the power of it. Uh, here's what it really means. A well-reasoned reply or response that adequately addresses an issue. It, it means evidences that support a hypothesis with reasoned and grounded thinking. 
He says, since Christ is made holy in your heart, always be prepared to make a defense. Always be prepared to give evidence for this hypothesis we have that God, that Christ is really there and that God is among us. Be ready to make a defense. And it goes on and it says, look at this, to anyone who asks you for a reason. Now, you guys, let's talk a little bit about this word reason. It's a Greek word. It means logos. Uh, it's a word that is the expression of thought. Uh, in other words, it is a verbal expression of an invisible thought or truth. You see, Jesus was the logos. He is the visible expression of an invisible God. And here, the logos is a reason, a verbal expression for the invisible thought or truth that we have. Be ready to give a defense and a, a, a grounded, reasonable answer to anyone who asks you for the reason, the verbal expression of the invisible truth. And now look at this, for the hope that is in you. Now, we already covered it, but hope is the Greek word of elpis. It means expectation, a trust or a confidence that is grounded in what is sure or certain. Be ready to give a defense for the reason, for the hope that is in you. Because you and I, as, as Christians, live with a hope that is inside of us, no matter what happens in our world whether it's good times or hard times, whether it's uh, easy things or incredibly hard things. We live with a hope that's in us. And we're going to ask a variety of questions in the next couple of months about what are those things in which we have placed our hope that is certain and sure. That's what we're going to try to address. Now, as you give a reason for the hope that's in you, he goes on here in verse 15. He says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Now, these two words are really important, I think, because gentleness is, the word, is a Greek word, which means a mildness, but not a, a, meek, uh, a weakness. That's a mildness, a divinely balanced virtue. The word actually means this. It means power under control. So this gentleness is not sort of meek and mild, pale, palatine face preacher from Palestine kind of thing where everybody's just, you know, all ooey gooey. It is power under control. It's being able to respond clearly, but under control. I think we've seen so many times that as Christians, when we get into a debate, sometimes it turns into an argument uh, about, well, about religious things. And it's not very gentle. It's not very uh, mild. It's not a divinely balanced virtue. It turns into something ugly, rather than it being power under control. But not only do we respond with gentleness, but we respond with respect. Because this respect, the Greek word is phobos, and it means fear. In fact, even terror, alarm, or reverence. Not only for God, but for other people. It means this. It means truth only with love. That's really our, our philosophy of apologetics, of giving an answer. It is to give the truth, but only with love. Because truth without love is simply ugly. And so we're committed to telling the truth, but let's do it with love. Having worked on college campuses for a long time, there would be people who would come to campus sometimes, uh, not there very often, maybe stay a few days, and they sit in the middle of campus and they would preach. And, and I'm not to judge their motive, but I probably will tell you I think their methods were not very good sometimes. As there are very uh, gentleness and respect seldom described their approach and their engagement of people. And so I think as we interact with people, we need to know, let's give a good, solid, reasoned answer for the hope that is clearly inside of us. But let's do it with a respect and with a gentleness that doesn't put people down. All right? Now, let's go to verse 16. It says, having a good conscience. This is really a beautiful word here. Uh, Sundu Deha, it says, and it means 
It means a persisting, unrelenting notion. It really means this. It is our moral and spiritual union that is mindful of its noble origin with a God-given capacity to distinguish between right and wrong and prompts us to act accordingly. You see, the human conscience is something that God has given us, and we can sear that conscience, that we can begin to not be so separated from understanding or distinguishing between right and wrong and not be prompted, but God has given us a conscience from which to live. And here it says, having a good conscience, so that when we are slandered, those who revile our good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, not by us, but by our behavior. And so this is a passive verb here, to be put to shame. It doesn't mean we put people to shame. It means that God does, through our behavior, will convict them of their slander that it's wrong. And so they will begin to see that in even what we do and how we respond, that they would be put to shame. And verse 17 goes on, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will for us, than doing evil. So, it seems to me there are some questions that we need to deeply ponder as a result of this passage. First of all, are you dynamically energetic for what is good? No matter what, whether you're slandered for it or not, are you energetic to do what is good? That's a call of the Christian life, is to reflect the goodness of God, what is inherently and intrinsically good, that we would live it out. Secondly, are you willing to honor Christ as holy in your heart? To set him apart. And it is when we set him apart that we set ourselves apart for a holy use. Rather than being caught up in all the things of this world. In all the, the, the temptations of this world. But we'd set him apart as holy. And set our hearts apart as holy to him. I think that's our call. I think if we're going to be relevant in our culture as a result of this crisis, we will need to be set apart for his purposes. Are you ready? Are you willing? The biggest question is, am I willing? Am I ready? And together, we might be his people for his purposes. Another question, do you feel prepared to give a defense to anybody who asks you for the reason why you find hope in what you believe and why you believe it? Are you prepared? We want to help you be prepared. And over the next Eight weeks, we're going to cover a variety of things that will help you have some handles by which to respond and explain the hope that lives within you. Next question, maybe a really important question. Are you infected with the kind of hope that determines how you live? Through this crisis, have you found yourself more caught up in the worry and the fear or more caught up in the hope that comes with Christ? Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have fears and we shouldn't wrestle through things. We're human. But if we never get to the hope, then we miss the gospel. We miss what Christ wants to do in us. Are you infected, not with COVID-19, I hope, but with the kind of hope that determines how you live? Next question. Do you understand the importance of explaining your faith with gentleness and respect. Because our apologetic is that we would tell the truth with love and never the truth with arrogance or hate or with a goal of putting people down. Always with gentleness, power under control and respect, a fear and a reverence to tell the truth with love. Last question. Can you defend your faith with a good conscience. That place where we make decisions of right and wrong and how we should respond and being prompted to do something about it. Is your conscience clear for how you defend your faith? So as we come to the end of this, what and why, answers grounded in faith and hope, 
we're going to ask some questions. When people will ask us, why do you have hope? And we want to answer with, I have hope because, and we'll give you some handles to work with. Because hope is that expectation, that trust, that confidence that is grounded in what is sure and certain. Now, you guys, as we enter into this new series, and as we do it from home, I pray that God would use this to encourage each one of us in each and every way that we might be people full of hope and full of a, of a readiness to give an answer to those who ask about that hope that lives in us. So get ready for the next several weeks. I think this is going to be a lot of fun together. All right? All right. See you guys. Love you.